I'm just sharing some stuff I've learned over the years, and I wish I wish I had a been able to listen to something like this. If you know, when I started out, um, I've been flying drones indoors for about six years, seven years, and um, I'll share some of those experiences with you. Um, we're going to go through a couple of topics, lots of videos, lots of crashes. Everybody likes to see crashes. A um, couple of tips, and it's pretty informal. Feel free to pop up questions, um, and Marlon can interrupt me if there are any questions that need, need answering during the, the session. So there's some opportunities, pros and cons, the, the, the requirements to look for in a drone, um, the equipment you're going to need when you get to a customer, and then when you get to a customer, what, what's going to happen there? What is, what is your customer going to expect? And um, just some things to just get you ready so that when you arrive, you, you're going to um, be able to keep the customer happy. SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, this is a pretty boring section. Um, and we'll skip through that quickly, don't worry. And then um, we'll get to the end here with some um, how to avoid crashes and plan for them. And um, then we'll end off with some of this stuff in future. So um, I'm just going to show a quick video. When I play the video, uh, the sound is quite loud in the beginning, so just be prepared for that, and I will try and catch it and mute it. So here's a typical um, indoor operation. You'll see a lot of this is this footage is taken in warehouses. That's where we've been doing it. That's our context. But um, you, know, you can apply this context to, to anywhere. Um, it's just some of, some of the tips that we've learned in a fairly uniform environment. And you take them into your own um, environment. Here's a different scenario. Um, and I'll go through some of the things that you are seeing in here and some of the takeaways from here that, that we've learned. Um, this is a training session we did a few years ago. So a lot of this footage is pretty old. You'll see some old drones. Uh, but we'll get on to some of the, the new drones soon. Let's get back to the PowerPoint presentation. And let's just move on to the next slide. Some opportunities, I'd love to hear from you guys, but you have been indoors. What is indoors? It's something with a roof over your head. Um, some mall stadiums, stadiums that are covered, factories, warehouses, combined hazardous spaces, that's inspections, photography, events, indoors, stadiums, cinematography. Uh, we, we do inventory, so that's where, where you know, my context is, warehouse contents, factories, fixed assets could be um, other types of equipment that, that's not moving. And then obviously sport drone racing, some of that's indoors. Where do you want to be as a business? This is just general advice given to me some by some investors. You want to be in the top corner here, which is profitable and long lasting. I mean, you can sell hardware, ship hardware, and it is profitable, but um, how long does it last? You know, people can go anywhere. And you want to be selling services, it's very long lasting because the people need you, but you know, it's just your time all the, all the time and it's hard to scale. So you want to bundle all this up sell software licenses, try and bundle something in, sell some hardware with it to secure that software, and then also sell your skills and, and services to bake it. And so think about that when, you, when you're doing indoors, don't just sell services, try and get into this whole bundle. That's just a tip, that's just try we, we, where we've tried to position ourselves with, with our company. Um, the indoor pros uh, of flying indoors, there are no rules. There's no FAA, there's no CAA. We've asked them multiple times, we've asked them in multiple countries. There are no rules. They don't care what you do indoors. The commercial, non-commercial, whatever. You can do whatever you like. There's no, there's no, you don't need any qualifications. Um, and so that is a really good opportunity. You don't have to worry about that. Um, none of our pilots have any knowledge of any of the, the rules. Well, apart from the, the other jobs, which is outdoors. Conditions, the great thing is you can do your inspections in that, um, your outdoor work, and then if the, the weather's bad, you can do it indoors. So if you're going to a site, and you can do it day and night because the lighting is constant. Um, customer location, we found that you know indoor structures are generally pretty close to cities, so you're not driving out into the middle of the, you know, the forest or whatever to go and do your work. And that means you, you can actually get power to charge. So there are some, some pros. There are some cons as well. So um, 
there's increased damage to your equipment. You look at this drone here, it's, it's always close to these shelves. Um, there's increased risks of safety for, for, for your staff, although we will go into how to mitigate those risks and at least identify them later. It's harder to fly indoors and there is increased fatigue of your pilots. I'm just going to show you a quick scan um, here, a, a quick video. So um, imagine this is your job to scan all of these boxes in a day with this drone. Here we are training some guys. This is actually in Argentina. And so there is, there is fatigue that, that can come from this and definitely on your neck looking up. Um, we'll get into that a bit later. I'm going to go back to the slide presentation here. Let's move on to the next. So what are the requirements for the drone? Uh, I'm just going to show you a quick video of Years ago, this is a drone that before Phantom was available in our country, and I uh, was taped some obstacle detection on here. And um, you can see the ultrasonic sensors there on this, this little drone, it's, it's just a no-name drone. And how do we get from there to those videos that we showed you, and even better, which we'll see you later. What, what do you need in a drone? You can see this is unusable. And I abandoned that because other people make drones so much better than I could ever. So what do you need? You, you have to have this hover stability. So you've, you've, you've got to be able to just let the drone go and, um, and it must just stay there. So anytime the drone's drifting, don't even fly it indoors. If, it, if you fly it indoors and it's drifting left and right, just go home, you're going to crash. Um, and how do they do this on drones? They use optic sensors typically. Um, here's an example. This is the Mavic Enterprise. You can see the optic sensor there. There's one on top. There's one on the side. There's underneath. And then of course there's a two on the front. So if you don't see those sensors or you don't see sensors on the sides, you're not going to get that stability. Here's the Mavic 1. It looks identical, doesn't it? But you don't see the sensor there. So this Mavic 1 doesn't have this as good as, sense, as stability indoors. It does. It's pretty stable. But the obstacle um, detection is not as great. It's got these two, and it uses those two to keep it stable. Um, but this is the enterprise is so much better. Obstacle de detection. That's also these sensors here. It's for obstacle detection. Typically, these are used mostly for obstacle detection. So on the Mavic 1, there's no sensor. You will crash this sideways. This one, you won't crash sideways. Talking about crashes, don't be scared. I will go into how you can avoid them. Let's get back to the topic, obstacle detection. So typically, the drone will push back if it, if it sees an obstacle um, and stop as a minimum. And sometimes it will reverse. Um, it will also give you visual feedback uh, on your on your display and audible it'll it'll beep and then also your controller will vibrate so um, if you're holding the controller and it detects an optical it'll vibrate you've probably seen that on it's been around for quite a while in the mavics um, robustness so the drone should be able to handle some basic um, collisions or touches of of objects not a huge obviously full speed crash and the way we do that is mechanical, it's prop guards. Um, mag interference as well, magnetic interference, it should be able to handle that. The last thing you want is indoors that it won't take off because of um, magnetic interference. And you'll see the lights flashing and on the app it'll say magnetic interference. We have found ways around that. You move it around till you find a place. Ironically, you put it on a sheet of metal and that often is neutrally magnetic and it'll take off. Worst case scenario, you can actually hold the drone like this. Don't tell anyone I told you that. You can arm it and, and, and then um, take off. Um, so mag interference is a big problem if you get on site. Just find a place and then fly it into the facility if you have to. I think it's caused by rebar in the floors of, of the facilities. The next thing is localization. So everyone wants their drones to just fly around the, the factory and come back and land. That needs um, SLAM, 
system localization and mapping this this isn't really available at the moment as far as i know let's hope we we get it um soon next slide um here's a slide i'm going to show you so a lot of these slides is, is our own experimentation and you can learn from our school fees so years ago we got this mavic one it's good for indoor use and we decided to test it okay. in a warehouse so let's we see how that went you the mavic in a warehouse this is a um, two meter wide aisle and it's great look apparently it looks yeah, looks fantastic doesn't it i'm just trying to mute this um marlon if you can mute the video it's going a bit to the right um, so that's manually being pushing it to the right there we go it's back position so you'll okay. see now that things um, don't go so well then put now we can um uh, when it gets up close, comes in, well, it's now detecting an obstacle and I'm trying to steer it away and it won't steer away. And, it just drifts um, and, and yeah, and it's that bad. And then fell to the that is a typical problem of, of these, these, and these and drones. It it's, it's, the when the drone sees an obstacle on both sides of it, I'll just go back and I'll pause. So it's seeing these boxes on this side and this side. And instead of just saying, look, I don't know where to go, I'll, I'll return to the controller it just picks a direction and moves in that direction problem has got better but um, I'll show you later on some tricks on how to get out of that so don't fly in nar very narrow spaces you're going to get that lockout until DJI can sort it out it's been a few years so let's hope they can um, so your requirements are that the drone needs to be able to handle obstacles, but needs to go in the space that you define. Just know the limits of the drone. So typically it's three meters. Less than three meters, you, you could have these, these lockout problems. Um, so let's just, I've shown you why the Mavic 1 is not going to, not great indoors. You can fly it indoors, but um, it hasn't got obstacle sensors on the side. This Matrice M100 we used for many years. We built a whole business on this. It's a fantastic drone. We've got a couple of them here. That's what it comes with. This will not fly indoors. Don't bother. You need to buy the guidance, which is this attachment on the top. And this has got all of those sensors. So here you can see an early version of what we now see on the Mavic with cameras all around, cameras underneath, a processor, and those are a lot of the footage is because of this guidance system on top. Unfortunately, this is being phased down. It's become obsolete. So you are forced now to go onto the, um, the, the Mavic 2. doesn't really matter if it's the Enterprise or the, the normal one. Both of them have indoor capabilities because, remember, you look for your sensors, and then you can tell if it's um, going to protect you in that direction. The, um, the M300... I see has got the sensors on, on all sides, and so it would be good, although it's, it's very big, so you, it's probably not going to work great in um, narrow spaces. So you can use this M100, it's great, really great drone, and it's got a good payload. The really good thing about this is you've got power, so you can, we, we design it, um, attachments that go on drones, and power, you'll see on this Mavic, um, Two, there's no power. Don't be tempted. That port is not USB. It doesn't give you power unless the attachment's on there. So you can hack the attachment and get power, but it's not a kind of scalable solution. Uh, let's just move on to the next slide. Um, here's the Mavic 2. Now you can see it in action. Uh, just ignore the backpack on it. It's got a really good payload as well. So this is our payload, this is just a, a promotional video. Can you see how um, stable this drone is? Um, that's the camera moving around, not the drone. The drone is right steady. You can see how close it is to the, the beams and the obstacles. It's not lifting. And um, uh, there's some more footage here. So, that's a Mavic 2. That, that Ranges, the, the drone of course can go unless you need a bigger payload then you need to go to M100 with guidance. 
Okay, let's go back to the slides. So what do you need? This is getting more into the administrative side of it. Um, you can just do this simple exercise and to figure out how many batteries you need for continuous flight. So we, we did a job in Argentina. We flew for 10 hours. Uh, we had a bunch of pilots. We had three, three drones, continuous flying. And so you, we used this to figure out, well, look, one battery lasts 15 minutes on, on this. On the M100, it lasts about nine minutes with our payload. And so it then takes about an hour 15 to charge. You can do your own experimentation, but it's got to cool down and then the charger will, will kick in. So you put in you know, um, an hour 15 of charging and then it's available for use. In the meantime, you have a second one with you and a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one and, and go and charge. And then um, you can see here that you need six batteries to fly continuously. You'll always have a battery that's flying. Uh, you, using this method, you take three with you and you, and you charge with three. You need three charges. Don't buy these multiple charges. You need individual charges that provide, that charge each battery separately. That's our advice. Lots of props because you're going to get little nicks and scrapes and the tips get a bit um, damaged. Also, here's a tip. When, you, when you're flying in proximity, check your props in this direction. If there's any play there, um, replace the props because otherwise they, they strike on the, the body of the aircraft here. The props flex and strike. And you'll often see marks on a drone on the top. That's because this is worn out. So just do those checks. Prop guards are really essential. You see a lot of these videos don't have prop guards. Um, so we've learned that the hard way. They just stop that little knock. Um, if, you, if this propeller strikes something, it's going to stall and the drone will fall. But if there's a prop guard there, sometimes the drone will just hit against the prop guard and it'll move away and it won't stall. So just use your prop guards. It's not for, for your safety. It's so that you, your little strike is not going to um, stall there. Drone. The other thing is, when it comes to indoor, um, one drone equals none. You may as well not arrive on site if you only come with one drone, because in the first five minutes you might crash that drone and break, you know, something minor, and the drone can't fly. Two drones equals one. So you know, if you crash a drone, then you've got one left. Three drones equals two, and carry on. So just try and come with more drones than you need. Uh, next. We're running out of time here. Some of the things you're going to come across um, in your when you come on site commercially, uh, you've got to have your safety and your risk assessments. I'll show you some examples of that. It's fairly straightforward. You just got to do something. It's such an unknown thing indoors. People don't really know what to do. There's no precedent for this. So come with something, look organized, and make sure it makes sense. And any, if there's a safety officer on site, you can give them that information. Remember, they've got to file that stuff. They've got to do something about it. And so give them that documentation. Standard operating procedures, have it in place. Um, you are going to have to deal with spectators. Drones are still novel. And they are much better to look at than your normal day job. So people pull out of their offices to come and look at. So have a policy for that. Um, keep the, the simple rule of spectators is um, keep, keep them behind you. There's some guys. Sorry about the sound. A bit loud. But Deal with one person, get them to do basic moves if they want to try it in an open space, as you can see. And um, everyone's behind, so keep everyone behind the operator. That's the basic principle of, um, of spectators. You will have spectators. Um, and then it is good marketing, so wear your marketing clothes. Um, there's other information you can give people often if they, this is on a typically You'll find a lot of people get this on an innovation budget and they want they want some photo opportunities and management and I mean for management reports. So give them that, those opportunities and just plan for them in your schedule. There's only one rule. I said there are no rules, but there is only one rule. Don't go under the drone. If you don't go under the drone, no one gets hurt. The drone gets a bit damaged, but you can fix it or get a new one. If you go under the drone, the drone falls, someone gets hurt, and then it's really a negative thing, and they lose their injury-free days and so on. And um, so here you'll see 
I showed this to my business partner, the other guy there. I'm flying this. I'm an idiot. Who, um, who did this with a flyer. And um, he said, he can't watch this. So have a look here. I'm going to tell you what happens. That thing goes into the drone as I look down. So I could have prevented this accident. I looked down. There it sucks in in slow motion, and there's the drone. I'm sure you feel the way we felt. This is all the way in Dallas. We came from Africa to demonstrate this to Dallas. Anyway, we fixed it and carried on the next day. So, um, But a couple of things here. Don't go under the drone. If someone is under there, they would have got hurt. And just, just tell everyone that that's a training thing. That's your main rule. There's other rules like don't walk backwards. It's very tempting to while you're flying to walk backwards, never do that because of trip hazards. Um, so there are some other things which you can adopt, but if you don't go under the drone, everyone's safe. And um, I did do a drone safety protocol when I realized these things uh, back in 20, 2015. And then uh, I've done it into more of a risk thing, but this is something you can do quite easily. Spinning propellers, um, you know, it's not, it's not a huge risk and it's not gonna hurt you if you stay away from the drone, falling drone, and so on. There are, other, there are a couple of other things, like four or five things, which just put them down neatly, and then you can hand them in, and that gets you kind of through the door on the safety side. Safety equipment. Typically, you use your, we use the warehouse PPE, so when you go to your customer, you will use whatever PPE they need, and then just put the addition of, of head protection. You can put eye protection in because of the, the propellers, um, and it is a good thing to put our provision. Some some customers have said to us, anything that spins, you need our protection. So typically, your your steel toed boots is pretty much the only thing. You don't really need to worry about this stuff. Just be aware of their fire policy and say, look, if the drone does catch fire, it's, it's very unlikely. But what's your policy? And some places have a run policy, which is great. If there's a fire, you just run. Don't try to put it out. Um, standard operating procedure. So typically, every flight you do have a plan. So I'm going to fly from here to there at that level and come back when the battery gets to X percent. So have that in your head. Pilots do that in real life. Do it indoors as well. Don't get lazy on that. Don't just go fly around and stick to your plan if you can. Walk the line. Walk down where you, if you can. Walk where you're going to fly. Obviously, in hazardous areas, it doesn't make sense. But if you can and you're doing some inspections, walk and look for, for anything. And those stick in your brain the 3D map that your brain creates. And so when your drone gets near there, you can, ah, oh, there's a piece of you know, fabric hanging down. I could, I could do that. Fly nose out. Nose out, this is quite important. It's always line of sight indoors, guys. Don't try and look at the screen. Don't, don't bother with that screen in, in close proximity because there's a, a delay. There's like a half a second delay between what you're seeing and what the drone's doing. So you'll get a pilot-induced oscillation and you will you'll move too far to the left because the screen's not updating. So watch the drone. Take, get out of the habit of looking at the screen and fly nose out. That means if you can, when you're looking at the drone, the tail of the drone is towards you. Um, and so that means that when you're doing the controller, say um, to, the, to the right, the drone flies to the right. If the drone is sideways to you, when you're turning right, the drone visually is going away from you. And so your brain has to do more thought processes than when you're tired. There are some guys who do that naturally. I'm not one of them. I can do it. But if you are fine, great. But most people need to fly nose up um, with the nose of the drone away from them so that it matches the two, the controller and the drone actions match. It's just much easier on your brain. Make a mental hat. Don't walk backwards. Crowd control. We've discussed that. Um, how are we doing for time? So reporting, this is just some tips to keep your customers happy. They're paying for this. They want feedback, and typically they want it on a daily basis. Take notes. Take photos for them. Put those photos in a, in a – it just makes your report so much easier. Do a daily report. Definitely, if you are training people, if you're getting into that providing of services and skills and you're training their staff, make it take a training register so they sign that they're trained. Um, measure performance of pilots. They love – the customer loves to see – this, this is our flight blog, so we measure how many, you know, whatever it is they have to do in that time, how many they did it, what their start time is, and so on. Um, log incidents, and then have your daily briefings before and after. Any lessons learned from the day, any safety incidents, anything that 
other pilots can share with each other. Those things really go on well with the customer and, uh, and you should be invited back. Your, do your return on investment, do some maths so that it makes it an easier to sell to these guys. Say, so, hey, we noticed that it takes X time to do this manually with the drone, it's less, um, you know, it's cheaper by this amount. You can do those, those sums in your context. Um, okay, so crashes, they are going to happen. So just be prepared for them so that you, it's not a disaster. You don't, you know, you're not, a, you don't go home and end the job. Um, you are flying in proximity. We have had problems with this M100 where it would just switch off mid-flight, some battery problem. Eventually we figured out two batteries, but for many years we had to just wait for this thing to crash. And so a lot of lessons we learned were from actual crashes. It's much better now. These drones are much, much better. And we've also learned, um, be prepared for them. Have a backup plan. So have another drone. You can fix them. We, when we used to travel with these M100s, we'd take a whole bunch of spares and an and a Allen key and we'd fix them. Um, don't cast blame on people, so don't blame the pilot. It's just, just messes up productivity. Um, blame yourself if you're the thing for not whatever servicing the drone. But just know that you are going to crash maybe once every 300 hours. Um, that's certainly our rough um, rough guide to that. And in the beginning, possibly a bit more. Most of the crashes are due to drones, that drone lockout thing we, we saw, and also that M100 switching off. Very few of the crashes are actually caused by the pilot, except that one which, which the video you saw of me getting entangled. Planning, so you need to test before you go. Um, test your obstacle avoidance. Test everything separately. So test the drone stability in an open area and just make sure you're comfortable with the, with the way the drone's stable. Check that it can go to the right heights. Um, then test that obstacle avoidance by flying it close, turning it, flying and seeing how it responds. And test in a narrow area. So the three meter thing, maybe this drone has improved. Um, and then also test in low light capabilities in the one where else we had to put these X's on the floor so that the, the downward sensor could, could have something to lock onto and stabilize the drone. That's a tip which you might, I don't think this needs it, this has got a built-in light, so if it can't see the floor, it just shines a light. Um, and um, test on your own away from any customers. Um, what about the future of indoor? So it really depends, I'm just gonna show you a video of some stuff, this is actually the past. Um, this is um, just a view showing you a comparison of one human versus two humans. So not only is it less cumbersome, um, but it's half, in terms of manpower, it's immediately half. And secondly, it's, it's faster. Here are some of the advantages here. So I think that the big limit at the moment for, for these for indoors, as soon as these things are challenged, is the battery life. We are seeing now starting to see 20 minute battery life, but still need a human to change the batteries. And the next thing that, um, that we need is SLAM. SLAM is a kind of um, mapping system where the drone just knows where it is and just gives you its X, Y. And it's got the map, it goes back and charges. Um, if this video plays, you'll see what, this is a, a ground robot we use. So ground robots currently can do this. They know where they are. Um, it doesn't. Oh, here we are. So this is what we I would expect to see coming out on drones. Is this something like this? I'm just going to mute it. It's um, this is an actual system yeah, that we robot. built. We don't only do drones. It's a ground robot, robot with a, a scanning system on it. When this comes out on drones, then um, you'll see the the uh, the use cases explode. Yeah. 